Proverbs 31, 28, her children arise up and they call her, speaking of mom, call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Now, when we talk about Mother's Day and honoring a mom, it means to make something big. And like I showed off with a picture here, I mean, to a, to a child, mom is big, dad is big, everything is big. But there's something about a mom that's larger than life, especially what we're going to talk about this morning. So when you think of honoring your mom, you need to think good of. You say, well, I didn't have a perfect mom. Well, who does? You need to think good of your mom, reminisce, praise, and thank just for being your mom. Just a gift of, of a mom. Here in Proverbs 31 is a description of a husband and some children doing that. Here it says, her children arise up. Now, men used to do this. When a woman would walk into a room, men would stand. It's very rare today to ever see that. But here the Bible says that her child, children arise up, and they call her blessed. They're saying that mom's a blessing. Mom does so much for me. I wonder... Gentlemen, we're, we're ignorant of what our wives do, and as, as boys, we're ignorant of what all our moms did. And if you think about it, she's probably been a blessing to you. She probably wanted to strangle you at least a hundred times growing up, and she didn't, and you ought to thank her for that. But, you know, they also recognize that she is a blessed woman of God. And this husband especially praises her for all that she is to him and to the family. And to have a great Mother's Day is where, you know, the kids just gather around and the husband gather around and says, you're awesome. You're a blessing. And it is a good thing to do. It's good for the family. I think that most of us have too much complaining going on, too much arguing, and too much manipulating. The only reason why people say anything good to one another is to get something from them. To sort of butter them up so that you get some money off of them. Sort of... Try to get them to obey. Oh, you're the best kid. Now go clean up your room. Yeah, that's not how you work. Honoring a mom is good for the family. It's good for society. There is a lot of twisted ideas about what a woman is and what her value really is wrapped up in. If you looked at the magazine covers, if you spent much time watching any kind of television, most still to this day in 2018, most women are still seen as an object as a thing, not even as a human being. And you wonder, why are all these women angry? I know why they're angry. Because they're just pieces of flesh to most, especially to the men, but they're also even to their own kind. Feminists are no kinder to women than the, the, the men throughout history. Women have had this devaluation of them. And you think, wow, in 2018, women should be freer. They're more enslaved than ever, enslaved to society's view of what a woman is and what a woman has to do. In, in modern 2018, women are only valuable as long as they don't get pregnant. Amen. Women are being honored today because they can win at boxing, because they're faster at running, they're better at swimming, because they're leading political parties. You know, it's a good thing to honor motherhood still. It's very important for society to honor mom. And it's vital. It is vital for every one of us to do. No matter, uh, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter. Well, I, not in my culture. Slap yourself. I don't care whether it's your culture or not. The Bible says, rise up and say, you're a, you're a blessing. Because... Culture doesn't define what motherhood is. God says it's awesome. You know, I, I, we got several cultures in our church, and I don't, I don't want to disrespect your culture, but I don't want to say this. I don't care whether you're American, Irish, Nigerian, French. Well, those always worry me. But anyway, French, German, I don't care what it is. We're Christian. And we try to line up my culture, your culture, with this book. And this book says, honor your mother, and your father. Moms are heroes. But often we settle for moms only being women who have babies. Oh yeah, a woman who's had a baby is a mother. <laughs> it's not that deep. 
Somebody had a big sign out yesterday in the march, and it said, um, uh, anatomy lesson for a feminist. And it had a, uh, a, uh, uh, an arrow pointing and to, the, to the baby in the womb, said, this is not your body. <laughs> then it pointed to the woman and says, this is your body. <laughs> and you go, all right, good, amen, amen. But, you know, we only stop there. We go, a woman who has a baby is a mother, yes. And it's marvelous, it's awesome, it's miraculous, but if being a mom stops there, then you've missed out what being a mother is, and you missed out on the honor of the rest of the story. See, our children need more than just a woman who gave birth to us. Because one of these days, a test tube is on its way. Uh, a clinic is gonna do it. No need for mom, no need for dad. Our children need more than just women who gave birth to them. And our children need heroes. Our children need true heroes, heroes of faith. And that's what God did. When God gave us a book, he gave us a book full of some amazing examples of moms who, who you can strive to be like, and they were all heroes. I mean, when, you're, when you hear about, about Spider-Man, and you hear about Batman, and you hear about Superman, and you hear about Wonder Woman, and you hear about What's the girl that's stretch woman, whatever, on Incredibles? You hear about all these things. None of them are real. But your mom was the hero you need to try to remember this morning. Father, we come before you and ask you to help humble our hearts and help us to stop believing and taking in everything the world says. And it's great. It's really great that actually society does take a day and Remember, Mom. But, you know, as Christians, Lord, we want to go deeper. We want to just honor. We don't want to honor a woman just for having a baby. We want to learn what it means to be a mom. The sacrifices and the faith that make them a hero. I pray that you bless our study this morning. Teach us some amazing things. Grip our hearts. Help the moms in our church Help us elevate the office of motherhood again. In Jesus' name, amen. So, by way of background, I need you to go to Exodus chapter 2. I've always wanted to preach on this. Exodus chapter 2. I want to tell you about the heroic faith of a mom named Jacobed. Exodus chapter 2 is one of those boy meet girl stories. Chapter 2, verse 1 starts off and says, There went a man of the house of Levi, and he took to wife a daughter of Levi. Now, you wouldn't say that's not a very exciting story. Oh, but you know, sometimes it doesn't have to be, you know, the most elaborate thing. Now, we find out, according to Exodus chapter 6 and verse 20, that the name of this, the guy's name is, is Amram, and the woman's name, young woman's name is Jacobed. And this, this guy meet girl story is throughout the Bible. It's even in your life, hopefully, if not now, in your future. And I find that when I find a guy meets girl story in the Bible, guess what I find? None of them are perfect. None of them are exactly the right height. None of them have the exact right hair color. None of them have the, same, the, the, the kind of muscles that the girl wants. You know, guy meets girl story is a good story. It's a good story when God's involved, amen? So let's start off here and let's watch God put two people together and do something wonderful. This story begins when they get married, not living together. I don't think, I don't think anybody in this room, I mean, I know what the world's doing, but if you're a Christian, you have no business living, with, living together if you're not married, amen? It says there, he took to wife a daughter of Levi. Didn't take a girlfriend, didn't take a live-in, didn't take a tax deduction. He took a wife. You know, marriage is where they became committed to each other for life, and that's a good thing. And then they had the miracle of conception. Doesn't always happen, folks. Look at Exodus chapter 2, verse 2, and it says, And the woman conceived, and she bare a son. Now, uh, having children used to be something you look forward to. I know they've banned almost all of the advertisements of of little baby dolls for girls. Now they want to get little boys to play with baby dolls. Just as hard to even say. 
but they, they take away the desire that's innate, that's designed into young girls to, to have a baby, to hold a baby, to love a baby, to be a mom. Well, listen, it is wonderful being a mom, and there is a miracle still in having a baby. You know, people used to instill a yearning to have children in, 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 uh, in, into children, but you know, now by the time somebody's 9, 10, 11 with smartphones and with all the technology out there, all they want is sex. That is evil. And until parents take the responsibility and says, I want my daughter to want to be a mom, not to be an object, we're going to lose our kids. Until we teach our son to be a dad and not just an abuser and not just somebody who takes what he wants, until we teach about the value of family, we've lost them. Are you with me? Are we going to be quiet this morning? The miracle of conception. Matter of fact, the Bible calls it, doesn't use pregnancy. The Bible doesn't use that word. You know what the Bible says? With child. Say, it never says in the Bible about abortion. It says before the baby is born, he's still a child. When a woman is pregnant, she's walking around, waddling, I don't know what it may be. She is with child. She's not with fetus. Amen. It's a miracle. Doesn't always happen. When it does happen, it's a miracle. Now, there's a dangerous time to be with child. Exodus chapter 1, look at verse 7. It's a dangerous time. Just like it was back in China, back from, 2000, uh, sorry, to, from 1979 to 2015, China had a, a policy called the one-child policy. You were only allowed to have, Exodus chapter 1, you're only, if you're a, a man and a woman, a husband and wife, you're only allowed to have one child. All other children had to be aborted. Well, that goes way back to the book of Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, and they multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. He said unto his people, Behold, this, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we, than our political party. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and come, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, that they join also under our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. We need their labor. We need these, these um, immigrants. We need these people to do our dirty work. We need them to do the lowest work. We don't want to lose these slaves. Verse 11, therefore they did set them over them taskmasters to afflict them, to keep them weak, to keep them beat down. Doesn't that tell, sound like the devil? to afflict them with their burdens. And they, and they built for Pharaoh entire cities, treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. They're like, how can we stop these guys? The more trouble we put in their lives, the more they keep going. They love family, verse 13. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. They made them work harder, faster, longer. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. And their service wherein they made them to serve was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra. Sounds almost like Irish. Shifra. Never noticed that till now. Shifra. And the name of the other was Pua. And he said, When ye do the office of midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall abort him. If he be a daughter, eh, let that one live. I run down to verse 22. And Pharaoh charged all of his people, saying, Every son that is born shall ye cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. This is a dangerous time to be married and having children. Uh, awful oppression. The government of the day set out to control just about every aspect of life. Is that not happening today? You thought you had the freedom of speech. You thought you had the freedom of movement, and yet the government is controlling everything we do now, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, where they control even your ability to have children. It's not a good day. Now go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Hold in your place there. I just got to show you Jesus prophesied that that kind of a day is coming ahead. Pro uh, Luke chapter 23 and verse 26. Luke 23, 
This is Jesus on the Via del Rosa on his way to the hill of Calvary where he's going to be crucified. Verse 26, Luke 23, 26, And as they led him away, they laid a hold upon one guy named Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. So Jesus ahead, Simon behind him, and there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. They were very sad, for what was happening was unjust, it was not right. Verse 28, But Jesus, turning unto them, said these words, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for who? All right, now remember, what kind of pe what people group is he talking to? To the guys? He's talking to the women, and he says, daughters, weep for yourselves and for your generation that's following, for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, blessed are the barren, those who never had children. Oh, I'm so glad I never had a child. Well, that's up to you. But Jesus predicted a day when women would be more proud of being barren and of the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gates they suck. And then shall they begin to the say to the mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us because that'll be the day just for the coming of the Lord. And we're there. We're there. Jesus prophesied that it'll happen again. It'll be a dangerous time. Focus on children. Simply the devaluation to making a child a bother. Making children... Just, just somebody you'd like to do without. It's a dangerous time. Now, I'm glad of the fact that Amram and Jacobed, even though it was a dangerous time to have a child, they went ahead and had the child. Amen? They chose life. I wonder if they would have been at the rally yesterday. God honored them. Go to Hebrews chapter, I want you to notice before I finish here, verse uh, 2, it says, And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, he was a healthy child. She hid him three months. Now go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And verse 23. And the words that are repeated all throughout this book are by faith, through faith. Look at chapter 23. I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 23. Hebrews. 11.23, by faith Moses, when he was born, quoting back there from Exodus, he was hid three months. How was he? By faith he was hid three months. He was given life, and then he was hid three months by his parents because they saw that he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And you know, God, you know what God did? You've got to think about it right alongside, right alongside the great faith of Abraham. I mean, great faith. Abraham, with his... I mean, he's an old guy. He's about 75 years old. He's got a 65-year-old uh, gorgeous wife. And, uh, I mean, for the next 30 years, every, every guy wants to marry her. But uh, he's got this beautiful wife, didn't have children. But God says, I want you to go to a land I'll show you. And he leaves his family. He abandons his career. He says, wherever you lead, I will follow. And off he goes. And step by step, he learns faith. He lives by faith. He's a father of faith, the Bible says. Right alongside with faithful Abraham, right alongside David, right alongside Daniel, right alongside the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right alongside the great people of faith is Jacobed and Amram. Because when they had a baby, they said, we're not going to let anybody get him. That's amazing. I mean, when we think of heroes, we think of heroes that quickly disappear into a phone booth and come out and able to fly around. But these, these great, this couple, this Jacobet and Amram said, we're not going to let our children go to the world. We're not going to lose our kids. God honored them and put them stuck right in there in the midst of all those other great people. Sarah and her great faith um, uh, throughout Throughout all of that chapter are people in great faith. And Jochbed, Jochbed and Amram, God honored them. Now they decided to hide their baby. Now you may not understand this, but that was an act of faith. It doesn't look like great faith, but they could have just gone with the flow back there in Exodus chapter 2 and, and, and just, just met society's expectations. Society... Pharaoh had ordered that everybody, if you see a child that has just been born, grab it and throw it in the river. But they decided to keep their baby, hold their baby. 
They wouldn't allow anybody to discover their baby, uh, their new baby. They hit him. Now, I have, to, I have to admit this. It's not a great plan. This is not a plan that's going to work for very long. I mean, how long can you hide a baby? All right? I mean, some of you are still trying to hide your 40-year-old son. <laughs> He's not my son. <laughs> they hit him. Think about mom and dad here. They were up against the mighty machine of Pharaoh and Egyptian politics. There were spies everywhere. They, I, we, we are so far, we're 70 years down the line from, from Nazi Germany. But I want you to understand what it was like to be in Germany and have a Down syndrome child. Because in Germany, there was no will of the general population to give food to a Down syndrome child because it was a waste of resources that should go to the war effort. So if you had a baby that was born and had Down syndrome, you had to flee. And that's the kind of life that these people were experiencing. They had a baby, a beautiful baby, a healthy baby. This baby's not going to die. There's nothing wrong with this baby. And if there was, that doesn't matter. They had this baby and they said, we're not going to let anybody kill him. I'm looking at the heroic thoughts of a mom they decided to hide their baby. They hit him as long as they could, three months. Now, evidently, people were talking. Maybe whispers were going around. People were being afraid that the baby would be found. So I see now, when the Bible talks about some things, sometimes he just emphasizes one point. It doesn't mean that there's not other things going on. But here, God says, I want to show you a hero. Her name is Jacobed. You see, I don't believe her name is that. Look at Exodus chapter 6, just for fun. Look at Exodus chapter 6. In verse 20. And Amram took him, Jacobed, his father's sister to wife, and she bare him. Aaron, and later on, we're going to see Moses and the years of the life of Amram were 130 and seven years old. So Amram and Jochebed are the parents of, of Aaron, another, another girl named Miriam, and ultimately Moses. So uh, here comes Jochebed in hero mode, and she did something that only God could enable her to do. Here's the plan. Look back there in Exodus chapter 2, verse 3. When she could no longer, she could not longer hide him, verse 3, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank, and the sister stood afar off to wit, to know, to see what would be done to him. Now here's the plan. The plan was to, to um, uh, let me hold here for a second. The plan was to... Um, uh, make a small box that would float. And it, it, that took some designing, and not everything floats, okay? So she designed something that's going to hold her baby, and she's going to put her baby in the same river that he should die in. So this is heroic, because she's going to take that baby, put it in an ark. By the way, ark means a place of safety. How many remember Noah's ark? When that storm was blowing, where'd you want to be? In the ark. So here, she's putting this little ark put together there, putting her baby in the ark. And this, I mean, a three-month-old baby, he does not know how to sail, Tony. <laughs> he doesn't know how to row, doesn't know anything. He's up just lay there and gurgle. And she puts this three-month-old defenseless baby in the midst of, of some reeds. Now, reeds are what, what, if you go by and you see a thatched roof cottage, that thatch there came from the riverside, just like where they threw, where they laid Moses' basket in the river there amongst the reeds. Sometimes you see pictures where the, where the mom is, is, or drawings, where she's letting the baby go down the river. That would not have been very smart at all. So they're not letting the baby just go down the river. She puts it among all the, she's in the shallow part of the river amongst what's called the flags or the, the reeds that are sticking up there. And that, that ark is sitting there. And she entrusts her baby to the heart of another woman, Pharaoh's daughter. 
Now I want you to see for a second in verse 5, and it says, And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. This is a young woman, probably the only child of Pharaoh at this point. It's a very important woman in the kingdom. Her son, at that point, would become the heir of Pharaoh. It could become the heir apparent. He could. Her son could be the next Pharaoh. As far as we can tell, she's not married, but she was rich. And she was a spoiled brat, like any super wealthy girl would normally be. She was a pagan, heathen, selfish daughter of a despot. That's Pharaoh's daughter. So tell me again, who was Jacobed actually entrusting her baby to? <laughs> oh, it's a Christian woman. There weren't any. There was nobody she could give her son to that could save her life. Save his life. She has to step out of the norm. She has to do what nobody would have thought doing. And when she does it, at high risk, here's the plan. Faith. Now, the first faith, hiding the child for three months, is given a record in Hebrews chapter 11. And it says, this is the beginning of a great man of faith named Moses. And we watch the mom now step out and say, I'm going to do something that I can't even imagine doing. And there she is, putting him into a basket, covering the cover of that basket, putting it into the water. And then if you notice there, in, in verse 3, she, she puts it all there by the river's bank, and then she walks away. Now, in, it, that's very important because great faith does not retain control of anything. When you, when you do actually live by faith, you have no control at all. You, 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 you trust what, what only God can do, and then you let God do it. And she walks away. She could no longer protect her child from danger. Jacobed could not even give her own life. Think about it. Jacobed has Aaron and Miriam depending upon her. They needed a mother. Uh, Amram needed a wife. She couldn't just give her life as much as I'm sure she wanted to to save her son, but there was nothing, to, nothing she could do to save him. All she could do was listen to these three words, or two words, was trust God. So there's a divine appointment here. And if you know what that means, it means the crossing of two realms, two things happening that, that only God can bring to pass. And look at verse 5 and verse 6. It says, as we said, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark, so they're all walking together, the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the babe wept. She had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. It's one of the slaves' children. And then said his sister, Now hold there, verse 7. I don't want to go too far because this is good. I want to say, real simple, God steps in the situation. When God steps into our world, what we thought was impossible just happens. So, Mom and Miriam create this basket. They lay the baby in the basket. They, they, they set the basket out there just before Pharaoh's daughter comes to the riverside, and then they pull away. You know, um, I think of uh, how God hides the baby in a womb for nine months, and now the mom has tried to hold on and hidden that baby just for three more months. But at some point, she's got to let go, and then she hides him in that basket. And she says, God, if this baby's going to be found, I want it to be under your care, not me under control. So she walks away, and she lets that baby be discovered. Now, she knew the routine of this other woman, this very powerful woman. We're not told Pharaoh's daughter's name, which is kind of cool to me, because she doesn't matter. Mama matters. Are you with me? See, God records Jacobed's name. He doesn't record the rich woman's name. Jacobed knew Pharaoh's daughter would be coming to the Nile River to wash, and she knew exactly where she would come. And think about it for a minute. Amram could not help now. He's a guy. This is, this is Pharaoh's daughter. If he tried to get near Pharaoh's daughter as a slave, he would have been killed. You get it? There's nothing dad can do. There's nothing as much as Amram, I can't. Amram's not being, being negligent here. Amram's not being a jerk sitting at home watching some sport channel while his wife's risking her life. Are you, are you with me? 
Amram would give anything to be there watching over his son. But there's nothing he can do. So mom's out there. But even then, she has set it down there in, in, the, in the very region of Pharaoh's daughter, put that baby in there, and then pulled away because nobody would really care that a woman's out there. And this, this risk, I just I can't imagine what's going through their minds. It's all on Jacobed. So with a three-month-old son in that basket there, covered up in the midst of all those reeds, somebody came walking by. This is what heroes look like. Heroes have perspiration on their brow. They have trembling hands. Their hearts beat a million beats a minute. They walk away from being able to control something like Superman. You shoot at Superman, what can he do? He can stop a bullet. He can take control, can't he? Batman's always got a repellent. There was one film from the 1960s. He's hanging off of the Batcopter there, and a shark is jumping up at him. And he reaches into his utility belt, and he has bat shark repellent. He always had something to control the situation. And the shark runs away. My point is this. All modern human superheroes always can take control. Amen? Jacobed can't. And neither could your mom. All she can do is, is do something that will enable her to trust God. I think she probably prayed as she walked away from there saying, Oh God, please, oh please God, save my baby. And then she had to walk away. She couldn't watch. It would have been terrible. Think about it. Because if, if Jacobet had sat there and just kept peering over everything, making sure the baby's okay and making sure that, that Pharaoh's daughter, some of you would say, she's a threat. So what's, what's this woman doing? Everything couldn't play out like it does. It had, it had to be that Jacobet had to walk away and totally trust God. Most of us have never been there. Would you agree? Most of us are so prone to actually try to control and say, you know, God, you help me. That's a good prayer to pray. But sometimes you're going to have to say, God, you're going to have to do it for me. Because at some point, when I get my hands in it, I mess it up. And I need to be able to trust you that you know how to do it better. Doesn't matter whether you're in a ministry. Doesn't matter if you're in a family. Doesn't matter if you're in the hospital. Folks, sometimes you just have to switch off and say, Lord, I trust you. So there they are, setting that baby into that basket. I mean, what a thought. What a thought. I mean, it looks cute there, doesn't it? It looks really quintessential. Make a movie out of it, you know? Must have been the most agonizing thing to walk away from that little basket. Now, again, Pharaoh's daughter, can she be guaranteed that she's going to have compassion? No. Would Jacobed have even been able to know, I know that there, she's going to take care of my son. I know that my little boy is going to woo her. She has no idea. Faith is like that. And Pharaoh's daughter appeared with all of her servants surrounding her, pampering her, showering her constantly with signs of affection and all of her daddy's wealth. She comes to honor one of her many gods in Egypt. They had God, they had the sun god, the moon god, they had the sand god, they had the river god, they had the frog god, they had the lice god, they had every god you could imagine. So she's coming today to honor the river god. And she notices a box in the water. You know, women notice stuff guys don't see. Amen? I mean, is that your sock over there under the bed in a corner by the back wall? <laughs> Like, how can you see my sock in the back there? And she should have ignored it. I mean, they should, she should have just, just a box. There's no cry, no sound coming from this box. It's just floating in the river. Why would you, flo why would you bother with some floating debris? And yet she was intrigued by it. And I think the Lord works on the heart of even pagan people, doesn't he? Don't choose to... Don't you sit there and go, well, my dad's not safe. My mom's not My wife's not safe. God can work on their heart, thank God, and can draw their attention to something that you couldn't have. So she notices this thing. And in that instant, I want you to see verse, uh, 
Verse 5, And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. Now just stop there for a moment, because what you're looking at, when, when she opens this, this box and sees the child, on cue, what does a baby do? That was when the baby cried. And I tell you what, I don't know, you have to not be human for a, 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 a young woman to not just be broken at a cry of a baby that's in your arms. She recognized this baby. She said, uh, verse 6, and she's had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children, an Israelite baby. This is one of the babies that my daddy wants to kill. Are you with me? And you know, a lot of these ladies, these women who are, who are uh, pushing for abortion and for abortion to 12 weeks, they've never held that baby. They never come face to face with a 21-week-old, uh, with a 21-day-old baby whose heart is beating. Uh, they've never realized that at 20-some-odd uh, weeks, 28 weeks, 29 weeks, when is it when a child is able to live outside of the womb? Not the one of the best of situations, but these tiny little feet and these tiny little hands move, and the, the mouth smiles, and the, and, the, and the baby reacts to pain. And when a woman looks at that baby and hears his cry, you're going to have compassion. You know what the world does? It makes mockery. It calls it a bit of flesh. It calls it a bit of tissue, a bit of, of pregnancy. It's not really a baby. Notice that? You know, here's a woman who's living in a country where her daddy is causing the slaughter of 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 newly born, they couldn't slaughter unborn children yet. They hadn't gotten that technologically advanced. But he's slaughtering newborn boys, and she sees and she holds, and she says, I can't kill this baby. Wouldn't it be great for every person walking into an abortion clinic in England to have to watch what actually happens to that baby, to actually be able to hold a baby the size that's in their womb, and actually hear that baby gurgle and giggle and laugh. See, this is a very, very pleasant message. It's Mother's Day. And we've got to reorient our thoughts of we need some heroes, folks. We need some moms who will take on and will face into the very heart of our world and the very heart of our culture and see it change. I don't want to surrender and just, well, the abortion's coming to Ireland. Not if I can have a help to it. Not if I can march, and not if I can write, and not if I can speak to, to uh, my TD, and not if I can influence anybody else, not if I can believe my Bible, and not if I can stir up some women who will say, we must save our children. We need some hero moms. Right then, that baby cried. Now, I think Mama Jacobed is within hearing distance. So here's Jacobed, maybe 30 meters away. Maybe she's picking up something, picking up sticks or something. And when she hears her baby cry in that split instant, what do you think is going to go through Jacobed's heart? This is the do or die moment. Will Pharaoh's daughter love or despise my baby? It must have been magical because she still can't look yet. I want you to see just the brilliance. When God writes a story, does it write it good? Does he write a good one, amen? I just find this Pharaoh's daughter's heart cut to pieces. She had picked up that foreign baby, that, that slave baby, that unwanted baby, and she held him and hugged him, felt his warmth. She saw his tears, and everything changed in Pharaoh's daughter's heart. You know, this woman let her daddy count, uh, slaughter countless other babies, but she was not going to let him touch this one. All of a sudden, she became a mom herself. And I want you to understand, thank God, you, you can be a mom without having a baby. It's called adoption. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. There are no unwanted children in this world. You may not want it. The mom may not want it, but somebody else will. Amen? Here's a new mom. In that instant, Pharaoh's daughter became a mom. Thank God. Thank God. She no longer cared about what her daddy would say. She didn't care what all her high society friends would think. 
She was willing to take a risk. She chose life. That's two, amen? <laughs> so here, oh, I, already, I didn't go through this. So here are all the great people of faith so far in this little baby's life. One was Amram and Jacobet as they hid the baby for three months. Then just mom herself, when she cast her child into the heart of another woman, hoping and praying that this other woman who had the power to save his life would save him. And now there's one more person we're going to focus on, and that's another woman. She's very young. That's the baby's older sister named Miriam. All three of these things built a life of faith in Moses that were going to make the, one of the greatest men in the Old Testament. Miriam's great faith is found starting in verse 4. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. So she's able to watch. She's able to look. She's seeing. We don't know. Somebody said she's about 12 years old at this point. I'm not sure how old she is. But she's old enough to sit there by herself and be watching what's going on. Down to verse 7 now. And when his... So... Uh, then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter. So I want you to get the idea. Up comes this little girl out of nowhere. Pharaoh's daughter doesn't know who she is. And, and she sees, she hears his baby crying. It's the perfect moment. Verse 7, then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go? Would you like for me to go and find a nurse? I'll, I'll go find somebody of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee. I might can find somebody. Remember, she's the child's mother's daughter. <laughs> See how that works? And Pharaoh's daughter said, go, without even knowing who she was talking to. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Can you imagine Jacobed who's still picking up? She doesn't know, is her baby still alive or not? She doesn't know if this has worked. She doesn't know whether faith is going to work. She doesn't know if God's going to step in. She's still doing something off by her side. And up comes a breathless, wide-eyed daughter saying, Mama, she wants you to raise that boy. (laughs) She wants you to be Mama still. I mean, that ought to just run up and down the back of your spine and you realize that's God. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the God of the Apostle Paul, of David, Abraham. It's the God of Jacobed and needs to be your God. Beautiful stuff, man. Miriam had great faith. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing like the faith of a child. Adults, what do we do? We become so skeptical. I don't know. I don't know if I... Uh, you know, a, a child getting at the side of the bed praying. It starts praying for some crazy stuff. I pray for a new bike. I, uh, I pray for a new puppy. I pray for a new brother. <laughs> All the, but you know what's funny about that child? He believes it. He believes it. Now, what can we learn from all this? I'm done. I want you to understand throughout this whole thing, God wants perfect homes but doesn't need them. What do I mean by that? Well, perfect homes don't exist. Perfect parents don't exist. Jacobed didn't even get to name her child. Guess who named Moses Moses? Pharaoh's daughter. She, she didn't even, she, there, was, there, there was a conflict here, folks. So understand, Pharaoh's daughter took over his life, but that was okay. He had a life now. And Moses is raised by two opposing worlds. He's raised in in Pharaoh's house, but who's doing the raising? Mama. And your kids may be faced growing up in this wicked world. You can't control all the stuff they see. You can't control all the stuff that they hear. You can't seem to control what they think or what they do. But I tell you what, you can raise them for God. And you can if you determine to be a hero. Not the hero that constantly keeps them from trouble, but one that actually steps in and says, i got to do what I'm supposed to do so God does what he can do. And God doesn't need a perfect home. Well, if you only know just how lazy my husband is. You know, the husband's not even here. Did you notice that? Now, I don't think the husband was lazy. I don't think Amram's being a problem here. I think God just said, you know, Amram, you sit by the side here for a minute. You panic over here. Jacobed, you back over here. Listen, I'm going to work with her. I'm going to show ladies off in 2018 what a real hero looks like and that we need heroes again. And I'm going to show that I can do anything through weak and feeble people. Amen. Moses was raised by two opposite worlds. For most of his years, his tutors, his wealth was all coming from Pharaoh's hand. But his education came by a slave woman. Amen. 
every day, probably at sunup, in comes this woman, very gently. She came in and she took that three-month-old baby and hugged Moses. She bathed Moses. She sang to Moses. She put on Hebrew clothes and says, you're a Hebrew boy. <laughs> and she, as he grew up, she told the stories of the Bible to him and how how God was the God of heaven and earth and God had made him and God had given him to his parents. And she told him of his daddy and of his brother and his sister. And she told him of, 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 of the God that was their God. And then by the time it got to around seven or eight in the morning, she sent him off back to Pharaoh's hand back to his tutors. And every night she'd come in and she'd come and she'd bathe him and get him ready for bed and she'd feed him. And every day she'd watch that boy grow. And every day she'd invest everything she could. She trained up a child like the way he should go. And facing into Pharaoh's political power and Pharaoh's uh, uh, mighty army power, she had invested in that little baby that grew up and grew up and grew up and one day was able to say these words. Go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11 now. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We read verse 23. Now look at verse 24. By faith Moses, when he was come to years. Somebody said he was about 40 years old then. Okay? He refused to be called no longer who? A son of Pharaoh's daughter. What a thing to choose. I mean, where'd all his pocket money come from? From Daddy Pharaoh. Daddy Warbucks, as Annie would say. Where did Moses get his big pillow and his soft bed from? From Pharaoh. Where did Moses have all of his servants waiting on him hand and foot? Where'd all that come from? From Pharaoh. But you know what he said one day? He said, Mama taught me who my people really are. In verse 25 goes on, it says this, choosing rather to suffer affliction with his people, with the people of God, than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. How could a man who grew up in Pharaoh's palace, in Pharaoh's pagan religion, in Pharaoh's wicked ungodly, demonic, heathen atmosphere. How could he make such a choice? Because of mama. Are you with me? How important is mom? You tell me that. I'm not degrading and saying dad's not important. That'll be for Father's Day. Today, to get us to realize just how important your time is, God doesn't need perfect homes. Pharaoh wasn't allowed to live in his own home. He had to live separate from mom, and yet mom made sure he grew up right. Amen. See, I don't have any help from my husband. I don't think Amram came in and helped Jochebed teach the Bible. She had to do it alone, didn't she? Secondly, there are no perfect moms. I read in my Bible, Eve was not perfect. Her firstborn son became a murderer. Hannah was not perfect. Sarah was a mess. Naomi was a mess. Samson's mother failed. If anybody thought they were a failure, Samson's mother looking at Samson acting the fool. Mary herself ad admitted that she desperately needed the very Savior who was in her womb. Yet God gladly recorded the lives of those people to teach us that we don't need perfect people. We need people of faith. That's what we need. And God has a high expectations of political leaders, and he does. You know, Leo Varadkar, God put him there. But you know what God says? God says, I expect Leo to do right. And when Leo doesn't do right, he'll answer to God. I wish that we could fire him. I hope that at the next election, he is put out to history. And I pray that somebody like this guy... Declan, McNamara, and these other guys, I hope they get into such positions that we can trust them or whatever. My point is this. God has high expectations of every leader all over this planet, but he can overrule all of them, amen? Just like he overruled Pharaoh here. 
So you say, well, our government, they're not letting me do this, and they're telling me I have to do that, and they're restricting me from correcting my child, and they're telling... God can overrule. You just have to be determined that I'm going to be a hero. And I want to say this, not all heroes are men. Now in the 20th century, we've learned that. But you know, in our Bible, we've come to find out that uh, God uses everybody. Ladies, do not complain about how hard it is. You know what our next generation needs to see? Both moms and dads doing the impossible. We've got to work harder than ever if we're going to save the next generation. And by the way, not all heroes are adults. I think Miriam was a hero. Would you agree? It took great courage for her to go. And I don't think, I don't think, now I'm just guessing, but I don't think that Jacobet had it all figured out. Now, we're going to go and set the, the, the baby in the, in the river. We're going to go over here. I'm going to pretend like I'm picking up sticks. Wink, wink. You're going to stand there and watch. And when Pharaoh's daughter comes, she's going to see the baby. She's going to fall in love. She's going to open it up. Then you're going to run up and say, I have somebody who... No, 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 Jacobet didn't have any of that figured out. Are you with me? But when she saw the opportunity and she saw the door opening that this, this hardened pagan heathen woman had a heart and was holding that baby, she said, that baby needs a mama. <laughs> and Miriam ran up there. That's faith. Not all heroes have to be 45 years old. Some of them can be 12. And God honors your faith. We already read there. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God, and it's impossible to do anything of eternal value. Keep going, ladies. You better trust the ark. You better trust the ark. What does that mean? The ark was a type or an example of what Jesus Christ is. He will protect your children as you cast them into his care. She, she put that baby in that basket, closed the basket, walked away, and that ark was a place of safety. And in reality, Pharaoh's daughter was just a holding place, a, 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 a person who brought Moses into the, uh, the home of Pharaoh. But let me say this, that baby was saved by the ark. And your children will be saved by the ark, Jesus Christ, too. You better spend some time giving them over to God. If you keep worrying about your kids and, and panicking over your kids and you haven't prayed for your kids and you don't give them over to God and say, God, I need your help. I need you to be in their lives. I need you to, to protect them. I need you to save them. If you're not praying for the salvation of your kids, they're doomed. They are doomed. Because all babies are worth saving. Even problem babies. Even babies that won't live very long after the womb. Foreign babies, babies that, that no one wants, pregnancies that might be embarrassing. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pregnant and, and I, I didn't plan to be and, and I'm, I'm not married. And the baby's wanted. Amen. All babies are worth saving. I just asked myself, how many Moseses have been aborted over the last 60 years? Who could have done so much for this world? How many Einsteins and, and um, Beethovens have been slaughtered? Think about it. All babies are worth saving. Most moms can and must make a real difference in the lives of their children. They must and they can. Not just by loving them. I don't doubt a mom's love most of the time for their children, but you can make a real difference by teaching them, training them alongside your husband. You know, in this church, not every woman has a husband helping her. But if you do have a Christian husband, you better work with him and not against him. Your children's souls are at stake. The two of you, God put you together as a team to train that child and to raise up that child and save that child. And whether your husband helps you or not, mom, you need to take the time to teach what only you can teach your children. Teach them how to love. Amen. Teach them how to pray. Teach them how to walk with God. You say, I don't know how to do that. You better learn because they are watching you. Teach your children how to trust God. You say, that's my husband's job. He may not be there. He may be a jerk. You married him. <laughs> but he's not what we're talking about today. We need some Jacobets. Teach your children how to stand alone for God. If there's anything more important than any of that, I don't know what it is. None of, did you know none of that? Loving, teaching your kids how to love, how to pray, how to walk with God, how to trust God, how to stand alone. None of that takes any money at all. You don't have to go to your husband and get money out of the wallet. Teach him any of that. It just takes some sacrifice of time and life. 
And I know some of you are. I don't doubt. I don't sit there and judge anybody. I'm sitting here just calling on all of us to make some sacrifice in the difference in our children and our grandchildren. I made some big mistakes. I just want to help my kids and my grandkids down the line make a difference because I don't want my grandchildren growing up in this wicked world without being saved and without loving God and knowing God and living for God. Now, not all plans are perfectly thought out. You know what the best part of any plan is? If you just trust God in it. You know, you can, you can do the most foolish thing, but if you trust God, God will make it. It's capable of making it work out, and that's cool. Oh, that was stupid. What I said, what I said was dumb. Oh, it didn't work. You have no idea. Don't worry about trying to figure it all out. You know, there are countless, are you with me? There are countless numbers of books on child tra training, on making great marriages. There are wonderful volumes and libraries filled with books on how to be the best parent, how to be the best uh, 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 spouse, and how to love your children, how to just, you know, at some point you have to step back and say, and all of my mess, I just want to, I just, I just want to believe God, even in my failures. And that's, that's what we need. Because out of all those books, you got to step back and say, my kids were not known or loved by the author of that book. That child was known and loved by the author of this book. And he put me in charge, and I'm going to love and teach that child, even though I feel inadequate. Amen? Here's the great truth. You have only so much time with that child. I don't know how long Jacobed got to invest in that child, but I guarantee you every day she was with him, I bet she made every minute count. Would you agree? How old is Caleb now? I mean, huh? Seven months. Seven months. He'll be seven years old before we know it. Seventeen, trying to get a car and driving. Oh, it races ahead, doesn't it? And you say, well, you know, when they get a little older, and then they are. And Moses ended up pretty good, didn't he? I think, and, and Moses, if you look back on his life, if it was Mother's Day back then, he owed his mom, he owed his sister, he owed his everything to, to the women in his life, man. And uh, when Moses chose to suffer affliction with, the, with his own people rather than live the spoiled, bright, li brat life of an aristocrat, it's because of his mom. I think a lot of us could look back and go, we sure have not succeeded because we got a lot of brats today, amen? Hmm. I just want to take a moment and thought, take some thoughts for you. I'd like you to bow your head. I want to pray for our moms today. With nobody looking around, I just want to encourage you that we honor you, and so does the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish my mom was here. She's alive, but she's afraid of flights, so afraid of airlines, so... I have to just talk to her via Skype or FaceTime, but we honor moms today because it's the right thing to do. It's actually commanded by God for all of us to do. No matter what culture you're from, no matter what day or age we live in, we honor moms. We don't honor just moms, but we especially honor our own moms. Because whether you believe it or not, they deserve it. And most of all, your mom needs it. You have no idea the sanity and the peace that it gives to a mom to be loved and honored. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you for every mom here. And I thank you for all the moms that chose life and invested in us. And a lot of them, if we look back, we go, a lot of them didn't, they didn't do very well. They struggled. They failed. But you know, God, I'm just thankful. I still bless my mom. I cannot sit in judgment of her because I was not, I was not the best son. I didn't make it easy for her. Lord, um, sometimes we just got to step back. We just got to thank God anyway. So, Lord, I, I, I bless my mom. And I ask that we all would bless our moms this morning. That out of our mouth would just be praise. We'd make them very big. We'd look up to them once again. I pray that our daughters never 
have to be heroes like Jacobed, have to go against the government, risk everything just to save the life of their, their children. I pray that we never have to face that in Ireland. But if our daughters have to face that, I pray they'd face it like Jacobed because they had godly examples in us. And I, God, I ask you to bless every mom and encourage them here with great fruit from their faith. Their children wouldn't just be great at, at, at math, wouldn't just be great at sports, wouldn't just be great at, at looking good, but that our children would be great at living by faith too. And they would love you passionately, God, because we did. And they'd serve you, Lord. They'd risk their lives. They wouldn't care about careers. They would gladly read in the Bible where it says that we must uh, lay aside our life, sacrifice our life, lose our life if we're going to find it. And our children would rise up and say, I just want to do something for God because I saw it in my mom. I saw it in my dad. And if you're here today, and you're not saved, you're not born again, I pray you turn your focus on Jesus Christ who has never stopped caring for you, gentlemen, ladies. He has never failed you, and he never will. He sacrificed everything in heaven and even his own life just to save your soul. You can either run to him in faith, accepting the free gift he offers you, or you will flee from the wrath to come one day. And if you are saved, you need to just thank him. Lord, thank you for giving me a mom. Thank you for loving me unconditionally, teaching us about love. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. And thank you for our moms. In Jesus' name, amen.